Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the book of Psalms, continuing our verse by verse study through the book of Psalms. We come today to Psalm number 47, resuming our study in verse number one. So get your Bible if you can, open it up to Psalm 47, verse one. While you're doing that, just a reminder, as I remind you on every broadcast, that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com, that you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages, just like we're doing today. That is at thebibleversebyverse.com. I hope you check it out. I hope God's Word is a blessing to you. Now, Psalm 47, beginning in verse 1. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. The writer says, O clap your hands, O clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Get excited about God. Get happy about God. Praise God. Don't be shy. Don't be self-conscious. This is God. He deserves to be praised. He deserves to get excited about. Now, reverence before God is very important. Absolutely. But I don't understand those who would applaud a home run and yet think it's strange to applaud God. God deserves the most enthusiastic expressions of honor and appreciation that his people can possibly give him. I cheer when the Packers score a touchdown. I cheer when the Twins hit a home run. And, and I get excited about God too. I better. Or there's something wrong with my priorities. Verse 2. For the Lord Most High is to be feared. He is a great king over all the earth. He is to be feared. God is to be feared. And you know what the word fear means? It means fear. It doesn't just mean being in awe of, and of course we're in awe of God, but I've said this before, fear God. That means be afraid of God. Not that he's going to strike you down for any little thing that you do. Not that he hates you and you ought to be afraid of him because he hates you. No, you ought to be afraid of him because he loves you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Serve the Lord with fear. For the Lord is most high God. The Lord most high God is to be feared. He is the great king over all the earth. Fear him. Respect him. Honor him. Anyone who has been around forever and has created all things from nothing has earned the right to be feared as well as placed in awe. Verse 3, He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. You know, he shall do it. The Bible says that the battle is not ours but the Lord's. That's what Israel said. The battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. When they were up against the odds, when they were no match for the challenges ahead of them, when they were no match for their enemies, they were reminded that the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. And the battle is not ours as Christians, just as it was not Israel's. In God's time, not ours, Truth, righteousness, and all things that are good will be the norm. God will get the victory for us. God will get the victory, more importantly, for himself. Verse 4, he shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. In other words, God will personally choose the proper blessings for his people. He did it for Israel. He can be trusted to do that for us as well. God will personally choose the proper blessings for us, whatever he wants to bless us with. That goes for Old Testament Israelites and for Christians today. 
God knows which good things suit us best. And that is what he will give us. If, if you're asking for a blessing and God simply a, a particular thing and, and God hasn't given it to you, well, maybe he hasn't given it to you yet. Maybe it'll still be coming. But if he hasn't given it to you, he's got a good reason for that. He knows it won't be a blessing in the long run. You'd somehow mess it up, perhaps. Trust God to bless us with the things that he wants to bless us with and the people he wants to bless us with, too. Verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. This may have other applications, but you can bet that it at least includes the ascension of Christ. And I don't have any doubts that the angels welcomed Christ into heaven with a standing ovation when he returned after his work on earth was done. I think, you know, they were in awe of God anyway. They were odd in awe of the Son of God who gave up omnipresence, confined himself to a human body to enter into his creation. The angels must have sat back and scratched their heads and say, what is the Son of God doing? He's just become a man. And he lived a sinless life and was treated in such a horrible fashion by sinners, but then turned the whole thing around and used it to pay for our sins. When that was all done, when he had been raised from the dead, proving that he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he would do, die on the cross to pay for our sins, he ascended into heaven 40 days later, and the angels welcomed him. There was a celebration like heaven had never seen before, probably. So he says in verse 6, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. Four times in this one verse, the Holy Spirit tells us to praise God. He is saying, never let the praise and worship of our God stop. Never. Always be in an attitude of praise even if you can't be praising him out loud at all times. Always be ready to praise God. In your heart, be praising God. You know, the real worship of God never does stop. Someone somewhere is praising God every minute, every second, every minute of every hour of every day. And even when they pause to catch their breath, there's a big group in heaven that never pause. So you are never praising God and thanking God by yourself. You might think you are because there's nobody else in the room. But your voice of praise is just blending in with the myriads of angels and saints in heaven who are praising God nonstop. Seven, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. The Apostle Paul was arrested and tortured by the Jews for preaching that salvation needed to be preached to all people, not just them, not just the Jews. They didn't like that too much, so they arrested him and persecuted him, tortured him. And God's reign over everything is the guarantee that everything will be okay for his people in the long run. And if the Israelites would have understood their own scriptures as well as they understood their human traditions, they would have amened Paul, not tried to kill him. Verse 8, God reigneth over the heathen, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. God is sovereignly reigning. Working behind the scenes, is in charge, and is in control. Things are not out of control. Bad things may have happened to you that you never foresaw. I got news for you, man. Bad things are going to continue to happen, okay? 
because in this world you will have trouble. Bad things are just going to happen. This is a bad world. It's the truth. And when you get inundated with stuff that you never saw coming, it may seem like things are out of control to you, but they're not out of control. God is in control. God's reign over everything, like I said a few minutes ago, is the guarantee that everything is going to be okay for his people in the long run. He saw it coming. It's not out of control. Rest in God. Verse 9. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. There will come a time when all the rulers on the earth will be united in their dedication to Christ, who will be supreme ruler over everyone. Yes, here on earth. Not on this earth, on the new earth that he will create. But every ruler in that day, every ruler from every nation, and there will be different nations on the earth in that day, will honor Christ. We're going to live in a world that is so wonderful that it really, it hardly pays to think about it because we can't imagine how good it'll be anyway. But it's enough to know that it's coming and Jesus will be in charge in every ruler. There will be no Hitlers. There will be no I won't mention any names, other rulers that have been bad. Verse 40, or chapter 48, Psalm 48, verse 1, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, on the mountain of his holiness, God is great. God is great. The thing is, none of us have the ability to know how great he is. He is greater than we can imagine. Verses 1 and 2, great is the Lord. And when God uses words like great, he doesn't use those words like someone who grades on a curve. Well, what makes God good is that he's better than most people. No. He's good. The absence of any bad, the absence of any wrong, the absence of any flaw. He's good in the absolute sense. And the same with God's greatness. He is great in the absolute sense of the word. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God on the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful in situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king. Mount Zion in Jerusalem was actually the earthly residence of God in Old Testament days. That's where the temple was. And that's where his official presence was. In the tabernacle, in the temple. Verse 3. God is known in her palaces as a refuge. You know why God was known as a as a refuge? back in those days because the Israelites had put their trust in him and he got through he got them through some extremely difficult times where the odds were stacked against them and there was no human explanation for them coming out victoriously except God and so God was known as their refuge until such a time as you decide, Christian, that you are going to offer God a sacrifice of righteousness, that means obey him, live for him, do things his way, even if, it, even if it's scary, even if it goes against conventional wisdom in this sinful world. Until such a time as you are willing to offer God a sacrifice of righteousness and thereby put your trust in him, not in the things of this world, not in conventional ways, but put your trust in him, obey him and put your trust in him until such time as you're willing to do that. You will never, you will never know God as your refuge. And you're going to be 
you are going to be robbing yourself of some tremendous blessings because there is nothing or no one better to trust in than Almighty God. Look at verse 3 again. God is known in her palaces as a refuge. We worship a God who we know. We know him from his word and from what he has done in the past. He is a God that we know from the testimony of his word that we know cares about us. He is a God that we can go to when the pressure is on. He is a refuge. He is a savior. He is that kind of God. And you will know that if you have put him first and put your trust in him along the way. You'll find that the word of God is true. No one who puts their trust in God will ever be put to shame. Verse 4, for lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. Many kings, you know, we're, we're looking at the history of Israel here. And many kings brought their armies to Jerusalem with the idea of conquering it. Powerful armies. And they thought they would just mop Israel up like not a problem at all. Piece of cake. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it. And so they marveled, they were troubled, and hastened, hastened away. The enemies of God's people were often in a hurry to attack Jerusalem because they thought it would be easy pickings. But when they understood that God was there protecting Israel, the enemy was in an even bigger hurry to get away. Verse 6, fear took upon them there and pain as of a woman in travail. A woman having a baby is going to be filled with pain. And those who were intent on attacking Israel were filled with pain and anguish. Once they realized the living God was on Israel's side, many of them didn't figure it out until they started for some strange reason to attack each other. That's happened more than once. Israel's enemies in the Old Testament because they looked to God for protection because they put him first. They put their trust in him. They found out that no one who puts their trust in God exclusively will ever be put to shame. And one of the reasons or one of the ways God protected them, and this happened more than once, was for Israel's enemies, these powerful enemies that surrounded Jerusalem to start attacking themselves, slicing each other up with their swords. And then their, their enemies probably never did figure out, hey, something screwy here. This isn't normal. Why are we doing this? Well, because God has put that in your mind. And whatever remnant was left took off running like scared rabbits. Verse 7. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Back then, military, back then the military power of some nations was in their ships, was in their navy. And that was pretty good until God turned their ships into splinters, into toothpicks by smashing them into the rocks. Meanwhile, Israel in the Old Testament and Christians today have the all-powerful God who never fails. We don't, we don't, if we're smart, we don't put our trust in things, even big things like a navy. God is the perfect one to trust in because he never falls apart like a ship up against rocks. He never fails, period. Never happens. Look at verse 8. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. God is the Lord of hosts. God is the commander of the angelic army. And as long as Israel was obedient to God, that army had orders 
to fight on their behalf. Verse 9. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. They meditated on the kindness of God. They meditated on the love of God. And if people would take the time to think about how God has been so kind to them, they would appreciate him more. Too many people, too many Christians, worry about the blessings that they don't have rather than thanking God for the blessings that they have. They take them for granted, and so they don't think about God like they should, and then they don't appreciate God like they should, and then they become lukewarm, and then they fall into trouble. It all begins with a lack of thankfulness to God. If you, would, you and I would just remember, take the time to remember that anything good that we have comes from God. Anything good that we have comes from God. We would never take him for granted. We would never be unthankful. Verse 10. According, un, according to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. God's name is known throughout the earth. Now, the word God in English may sound different in different languages, but all God's people who truly know Jesus Christ everywhere know that he is there. Everyone also knows that God is holy and that they have to answer to him on his terms. Verse 11, <coughs> let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Be glad, Israel. In other words, because remember, that was the original audience that he was writing to. All the Bible is not written directly to us, but all the Bible is written for us. So this is for us as much as it was for Israel. But remember that he was talking originally, God was talking to the Israelites. Now we could pull principles and truths out of these things, but it was written first and foremost to the nation Israel in the Old Testament. So he's saying, be glad Israel, because God will personally make sure that you will be treated fairly. Now, let's pull that principle out for today. The Israelites were God's people. You're a Christian. You're one of God's people. Take it one step further. You're God's child. An Israelite was never called a child of God. But you have been elevated to that position, adopted into a family of God when you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if he would do that for his people, if he, if he would make sure, and he did make sure, that they were treated fairly when they walked with him, you can bet you're a member of his family. He's going to do that for you. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't be true to himself. Right has to triumph. Unfairness has to be punished. And those who suffer unjustly must have their situation reversed. They must. Because God is a God of justice, and he will bring it to pass. It'll happen. Eventually. The eventually part, that's what it means to live by faith. Because you're living for that eventually. And if you believe the word of God, you have faith in God and in his word, you will do it. And if you don't have faith, you won't do it. It's that simple. It's easy to see if, if a person has faith in God, faith in Jesus, faith in the word of God or not. If they do, they persevere in the Word of God, and they trust in God, they wait on the Lord, they serve Him, because they know eventually God will, God will win, and they will be blessed, and the wicked will be punished. So it doesn't pay to turn your back on God. Those are the people who have faith in God. It's not that hard to figure out. Faith without works is dead. You either trust God or you don't. And if you do, your actions and your words will reflect that. Verse 12, walk about Zion, 
go round about her. Count the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation that follows. In other words, look at and appreciate the fact that none of those Jerusalem landmarks are at all damaged by the enemy. Why? Because of what I said earlier. The enemy surrounded Jerusalem many times, thinking that, thinking that they're going to wipe them out without a problem, take over the city, burn the city down. That did not happen until God said, let it happen, because the Israelites were in such rebellion against him. But up until that time, when they were living for him and they were seeking him, the enemies became smart alecky and they became arrogant and they thought that they could destroy Jerusalem, but they, they always failed because God fought for the Israelites. And so now the writer is saying, hey, Israel, take a look around. Remember when your enemies were boasting about destroying you, ransacking the city, wiping it out? Take a look. Hey, all the buildings are still standing, aren't they? Nothing has been damaged by the enemy. And it is a good thing to be reminded that things could be much worse than they are. And that is always the case for Christians. Things could be much worse than what they are. Even if, even if you as a Christian has nothing good today, not a thing in this world, you are desolate. And you're about ready to check out you still have a great eternity, eternity. Things could be much worse. You're not going to burn in hell. 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. If God is your God, you can be sure that God is your guide also. Listen to me. If God is your God, if you have repented of your sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you have offered him a sacrifice of righteousness, and you daily offer him a sacrifice of righteousness, you do the right thing, and you put your trust in him, and you confess when you fail, because we all fail, but if you do that, if God is your God, if Jesus is your Lord, then you can be sure that he is your guide also. You don't have to go looking for the will of God. You're in it. Oh, I'm scared I'm going to miss the will of God. I don't know. Are you walking in the moral will of God? Are you offering God a sacrifice of righteousness? Are you putting your trust in him? Well, yeah, I'm doing that. You're in God's will. You can pray for things to change for the better. You can pray for good things. You can pray for things that you want. But as it stands right now, you are in God's will right now. Take a snapshot of where you are. You're in God's will right now. If God is your God, if Jesus is your Lord, you can be sure that he is your guide. It may not feel like it, but don't go by your feelings. You may not like it, but whether we like something or not does not determine if God is leading. I better say that one again, don't you think? Whether we like something or not does not determine if God is leading. He guides us today. And he will guide us after we die because he said so. Out of time. For more of God's word, go to thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the word of God verse by verse using my audio Bible commentaries from Genesis through Revelation 3 complete series at your pace, at your convenience, at the Bible versebyverse.com. If you haven't gone there and checked it out, I encourage you to do that right now. And please remember, this ministry has been a faith ministry for over 30 years, which means that I've been teaching the Word of God just exactly as I have done today, verse by verse, without watering it down. I've never been under, underwritten by a large church or denomination. That's okay. I rely on God. I speak the truth. I do what is right in his eyes to the best of my ability and say what I know is true without watering anything down and trust in him. It's a faith ministry, which means that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. And you can stand with me and be a part of getting out God's word 
with your prayers and by clicking the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. Until next time, so long.